Please help me welcome Eduardo Bonet, Staff Incubation Engineer, Machine Learning Ops at GitLab. Eduardo has worked as an Android developer, data scientist, and analytics and machine learning engineer. His first deployed machine learning model was an R script wrapped within a Go server. He's currently working on making GitLab a tool that data scientists love to use. He's joining us to share his wisdom and to outline steps we can take to decrease the risk of machine learning solution dying in the prototype phase and how to be more efficient that we're solving the right problems. Please don't forget to drop your questions for him in the live discussion section below. Thank you, Edward. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this talk about informed guesser, minimal viable model, and heuristic first. I'm going to talk about this one, each one of these a little bit later, but let's begin. So right now, uh, Machine learning is finally passing its hype phase. So we went through the hype of machine learning where uh, inflated expectations were expectations were really high. Everybody wanted machine learning. Uh, and that led to a lot of issues because machine learning is not a magic wand, uh, one that solves everything. So right now we are actually in this uh, uh, the delusionment phase where we are starting to learn that yes, machine learning is not for everything. Um, and my goal with this talk is a little bit to push into the enlightenment phase, uh, where we understand where and how uh, to bring machine learning uh, a value out of machine learning, business value out of machine learning. So building machine learning is difficult, uh, time consuming and expensive. And this is why we're gonna be talking about the risky machine learning. My name is Eduardo Bonet. I'm a, a full stack developer uh, in the incubation engineering uh, at GitLab, specifically for MLOps. And I've worked as machine learning engineer and data scientist before, uh, but now I'm more, more focused on uh, features for machine learning itself. But what are some common problems that we see uh, happening often uh, with machine learning? What are the pain points that I've seen very uh, a lot of times? First of all, the first problem that leads frustration down the road is not understanding what the types of problems machine learning can tackle. Uh, you usually have uh, very few people that understand machine learning, and those might not be the same that have ex that are closer to the user base and know what the users want. So understanding which problems can can uh, bringing the knowledge of machine learning to the business part that has closer. Uh, contact to the user can help drive uh, better, uh, can help bring better ideas for uh, uh, solutions with machine learning. Second is failing to communicate with results with stakeholders. Um, and third, discovering too late the users don't want that product. Those are three very common problems that I see uh, uh, with machine learning. And these are a problem with every, uh, every to every solution, I, I would say, but the fact that machine learning takes so long to push something uh, into a production mode, or it takes long time to deliver, it takes long time to create the model, to deploy the model, it makes these problems a little bit more exacerbated than uh, regular software development. So I'm gonna talk about one technique for each of these problems, how to tackle, how to reduce the, 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 the impact of each of these problems using one technique for each. For the first one, I'd like to talk about informer, informed guesser. Um, I'm gonna see what problems are candidates for ML by thinking about informed guesser. Think that you have a game called The Weight is Right, where you ask contestants uh, to guess the weight of, I don't know, this cup. Um, they don't have a, a balance, of course, uh, they don't have a weight, uh, and they have to guess the weight. Um, and if you just ask out of nowhere, they will give some, uh, some value, but you can also ask them to prepare for this. So suppose that they, they know that they're going to be partic participating in this game and three weeks before they start, I don't know measuring a lot of random stuff, they get a weight and they start measuring. So they have this intuition about uh, how much something weights. And this is the informed guesser. The informed guesser is within a game and it gives answers, but it, they might not be uh, able to understand the mechanism behind it. 
So I know I might know that this, I don't know, weighs about 200 grams, but I don't know really about why it weighs 200. Is it about the density in the material that uh, this uh, the, this uh, cup is made of? Is it, um, I don't know, the interaction between the atoms that cause this weight and so on and so forth? Or also the, yeah, so it doesn't really understand why. It just finds patterns and guess based on them. The second point about informed guesser is that the better you inform the guesser, the better the guesses will be. So, like I said, if I just show this to, to a contestant out of nowhere, like, okay, you're going to participate this now, in, in this right now, they will not be really good at the game. But if you prepare them and you give them uh, a way to learn about the weights, a, a way to draw these patterns themselves, the better the game they will be. And finally, you cannot expect a guesser not to make mistakes because, well, uh, it's a guess. Uh, they, 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 they will even as better as they get at a game. They will make mistakes uh, all the time, and hopefully, they will be they will make less uh, mistakes later on. But they will make nevertheless mistakes, and the question is how often. And this is a way of thinking about machine learning. Machine learning is an informed guesser. Machine learning is a uh, set of algorithms, a set of techniques that learn patterns from data. And they will make mistakes. Uh, you can't avoid uh, that. Um, but it, using the informed guesser uh, image or, 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 or this, uh, this, this idea, makes it a lot easier to understand what kinds of problems machine learning can solve. Machine learning is really good. It can be really good if you have first data available uh, that you can draw patterns from and make less mistakes or not make as many as before. Uh, for example, you should not use machine learning for a problem that you need perfect answers for. Um, or that you need to know exactly why that output came out of the uh, what was made by the by the model. Um, it relies on there's a lot of uncertainty around. So when you, you you consider machine learning for a use case, you need to understand what is the cost of making a mistake within. Is it feasible or not? Uh, sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. For example, if you have uh, medical applications and you are trying to detect the presence uh, of a disease or not, um, it might be that if it makes too many mistakes, you're going to end up in some legal problems. And if that's not that's not a good use case for machine learning, for using machine learning at all. So anyway, the other two points are also very important. So you need data available. Machine learning doesn't exist without data. Um, you need enough data to create that, to so that the, the algorithm can learn those patterns from. So when you look at your um, at your area or, or at your domain, good cases for machine learning are this one. These ones, when you have data available and you need to infer patterns uh, to make less mistakes uh, than you usually do now. Some of these cases that, uh, that happen is search. Uh, so you need to find the best um, movies for a user. It's okay to make some mistakes over here. You have a lot of data available from usage by other uh, users um, so that you can draw groups, you can draw patterns, or for example, categorization, identifying if and uh, types of animals, you get, I don't know, you have a lot of image, making mistakes is not, a pro not, not such a big problem. Um, so this types of problems where you should, uh, where you could use machine learning. So the informed guesser is the first uh, thing that I use uh, to try understand and try to communicate, talk with business where we could apply machine learning for. Um, and then this was the first problem. This is the first technique that I that we talked about: the, the learn the, the the informed guesser. The second problem is about expectations, and this this is where we talk about the minimum viable model. Then to start this question, I will to start this, this discussion, I'll first ask a question. So suppose that I create a product recommender that increases sales by 
is this a success or not? Well, it will depend what were the original expectations uh, from this product. So if the, the, the business expected a 5% uh, increase in sales, that's a huge success. But I've been in a place where, where we developed a product recommender that, um, that had a 20% success, but business expected 50% success. There was, there was no communication. Uh, there, there was no proper communication in the beginning. And because of that, the, inflate, the, the expectations from uh, business were extremely inflated. And, the, pro the, the, and the, the, the project was doomed to fail from the beginning because it was just impossible to reach that, uh, that expectation. And how do we tackle this? How, to, how do we go about uh, improving this communication with business, uh, not with business, but across the whole, uh, all the stakeholders that are involved with uh, this project? So one way to do this is through the minimum viable model which is the model with the smallest performance necessary to achieve success. Uh, well, similar to so minimum of our product is a reflection. But the key here, the biggest question over here, this whole thing is how do you define success for this project? And uh, I, I like to follow a small process for this, at least to, as a thought process to drive this, uh, uh, the, this, um, consensus of, of whatever is success for that group. It starts with the first step, which is defining the vision. The vision is not a technology. The vision is not a solution. The vision is not a um, something tangible sometimes even. The vision is an experience that you want to drive to the user. So for example, for the recommender, uh, following up the recommender example, the vision could be users spend uh, find uh, the the uh, find the the best movies for them quickly this could be they spend very little time uh, looking at the the list of, of movies to watch this was one vision so then i have the now the now is the situation that they currently so they spend a lot of time searching for a, for a movie for a good movie to watch and the future is the, the where we want to go they don't spend time at all. Note that the vision is not always even achievable. Sometimes it's just very, very, um, uh, what's the, the word? They are very, oh yeah, the, really hard to get, almost impossible to run, but still worth it uh, as a guide to where we want to go. It's a North Star. So now we have the now and then we're going to the future. Uh, the step two is to find things we can measure that will let us know that we're moving in the right direction. So for example, for the recommender, I am in the now and in the future, uh, and I want to get to the future. And the future is, well, users don't spend time looking for uh, movies. So a quick metric for this would be, uh, it could be uh, the well, time to, to find. And also, for example, I don't know how often the, chosen movie is the first one of the list right uh, so if i show the first they will get there faster so one metric for that we could use this is how often the the the, the movie is within the first uh, movie that was displayed then we identify what is the current situation with that metric for example, okay, so right now, on average, the 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 the, the, the user will watch, will watch the tenth movie in the in the list, or the twentieth, and we want to see what success look like. The success would like, okay, well, the first for everyone is not really achievable, but we can think, I don't know, the fifth would be okay. That would mean uh, loading less time, uh, less time loading the page. Uh, they would get there faster. So, okay, we want to bring it down from the 20th to the th to the to the fifth uh, uh, on average for 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 users. So this uh, and this this is not a process that you do within your own team, right? This is not a process that is driven by the technical part. It's a process that that is between the technical group. But also the the the, the business uh, the stakeholders. This is done together with them, so that you you can 
drive this communication and avoid frustrations down the road. Uh, so here, okay, then we have the success on the business metric. The next step is to find a model performance metric that matches the business metric. So when we talk about business metric here, we were talking about the, the average uh, position of, of the movie on the list. So a model performance metric that I mentioned here is, well, metrics that are used for models. So they are more technical metrics. For example, within a recommender, you could have a minimum average precision, uh, which would be a metric that could reflect this business metric. But this is a very technical metric. We are already talking about performance here. So I, I, we need to try to find a technical uh, metric that reflects on the business metric. So moving the technical moves the business metric as well. Once we have that, we can translate what is success on the business metric to what is success on the performance metric. And now this creates the connection between all the way from what we wanna see in the end on the user to all the way down to the performance of the model. So we brought from business into technical, uh, a business requirement into a technical requirement over here. And with this, it's a lot easier to drive communication between uh, the technical team and, and uh, the stakeholders. So from the beginning, you already have this conversation. This is done a lot before the first line of code is, is written or I don't know, as early as possible in the development. It helps a lot on driving this communication and avoiding uh, uh, broken expectations later on. Because now with the success that you have, with when you, you when you do this transformation and you see, okay, oh wait, 50, that, uh, that metric would mean I will have to increase sales by 50%. That's just not possible uh, within the models that we have, within, with the data that we have. That's just not possible this time. So you can, cut the, the project from the beginning, even if that becomes the case. Um, some ideas over here is that at no point we spoke here about technology. We didn't speak about which model, I, we didn't speak about which or which stack to use, or is it TensorFlow, or, or should we use here, uh, I don't know, uh, random forests or neural networks. This is just about where we want to get. This is just about what's the minimum that needs for this to be considered success. All te technical decisions will be driven from this afterwards, right? This is the minimum. And the final number that you reach at the M MVM is not as important as the process that led to that number. So you're going to reach an estimate which will likely fail like the number will have will have to be ad adjusted over time um with new data with new assumptions or well, you define had some assumptions that are not that are not valid anymore um but the point is that this becomes a framework to talk about what everybody's expectations is about the project from the get-go not wait six seven months until uh until the first time we're going to talk about this no right from the beginning. Of course, there are some challenges with this framework. Um, often, like for example, if, if you are working on a uh, multi-sided market where you have multiple users, multiple types of users, um, you have to balance between those users. Okay, what's good for one, what's better for one. For example, if you if you work for a, uh, for a travel agency, uh, online travel agency, the cancellations are really good. Um, uh, free cancellations are really good for the user, but really bad for the uh, for 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 hotels. So sometimes metrics conflict, and you need to consider them out. So you're gonna have multiple uh, ways of defining success or not. Um, then again, the point is just talking about this in the beginning. Uh, is really bringing the conversation and avoiding having this conversation when it's too late. Um, and the final point that I, that I want to talk is how to validate faster. 
uh, ideas. So it's a big problem with machine learning is that you have this group of people that start working, uh, creating the models, and then they create a prototype, and then six, seven months, eight months down the road, they push the production, and it doesn't work. It just fails because it doesn't match what the users uh, want. Uh, we, they find out that the use case cannot really be used, uh, uh, solved with machine learning, uh, and so on and so forth. So for this problem specifically, just start without machine learning. Deploying machine learning is expensive. You need an entire additional stack uh, to be able to track models, to be able to validate them, train them. It's an entire world that you are adding, a uh, process that you're adding into your development cycle. And ideally, you want to avoid doing that as much as possible and just try the simple stuff until the simple stuff is not uh, does not work anymore, right? Until the next step becomes actually using machine learning. So for example, uh, starting without machine learning and with heuristics or with uh, um, a human in the middle, human in the loop, reduces time to market. So for example, if I want to go and create a recommender, uh, well, okay, I will spend a lot of time um, creating the model and getting it ready while I could just do something stupid and deploy as a regular software, uh, software like any other, and have the users come and validate the, met the metrics from the get-go before I start with the machine learning part. It's really cool using not machine learning because it guides also the data collection. Uh, while you are deploying this, while users are using that not the best solution that you have deployed, they are generating data um, that you can use later on for uh, the machine learning model. And it also guides what is necessary to, to collect in the first place. A lot of times it happens that, okay, machine, uh, we start with the machine learning model and then later on we find that the data that we use for the machine learning model is not really, it's not really possible to gather the data in the frequency that, want, that we want, for example. And having already a product that works without machine learning or we are improving upon with machine learning uh, means that we already know what which data is available to us at that point. Um, you know, like I said, it avoids dealing with MLOps early on. Uh, MLOps, it's complicated, uh, it's new, it's a mess, and people are learning how to, to deal with MLOps. Um, so starting without machine learning and with something simple avoids this entire complication and lets the team focus on whether this is a valid use case or not. And uh, all of the things that you can use, like heuristics to, to create a product, in addition to the data that you collected, heuristics in itself can become features uh, for this model. So you, you gather some knowledge, some domain knowledge about the, 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 the problem at all. So for example, instead of creating a complicated or neural network uh, based recommender or uh, whatnot, I mean, start with the most popular per, per category. You can do this with a SQL query. Uh, meanwhile, you're already building the front end, you're already building the back end, which will be pretty much similar. And later on, you can plug in the machine learning model once uh, you test that. You can use heuristics, which are just rule of thumb. So for example, suppose that you want to create a, a model to detect if an image is a meme or not. Well, meme images usually have a lot more white pixels because they have the text on top. This could be a heuristic for identifying this in the beginning. Um, you can use human in the loop as well. So for example, you're trying to test out a chatbot uh, that you're creating. Have someone answering the questions on the other side instead of a bot. That validates the, the, the human, the, 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 the user use case at least of wanting that interaction with a chatbot. Because sometimes you spend like, I don't know, five months building a chatbot and then you deploy and then nobody uses the chatbot because, well, nobody really wants it. So it's easier to deploy as a chat and have someone answering on the other side and then scaling later. And on this point, and the same way that we talked about machine learning as a, a informed guesser, you can also think as machine learning as automated heuristic finder. 
It looks at the data, and instead of you coming up with uh, the heuristics yourself, you allow the algorithm to come up with the, the heuristics for you, for you. So, and you don't really automate until something until it actually makes sense to automate, right? You don't automate a process that it's not really useful to automate. So you first start with something without any machine learning, and then later you automate the process when it makes, makes sense to do so. So in summary, we talked about here, it was a very short uh, time, but we talked about three ways or three techniques or three uh, uh, forms of, of reducing, uh, of de-risking machine learning. So for one, the first one is a way of thinking about what is machine learning and what problems it can, it can tackle, which is the informed guesser. Machine learning doesn't understand the why it's guessing something. Machine learning is only drawing patterns out of the data and to make some guess. So first of all, it will never be perfect. It's about, we, we, uh, we need to take into account what's the cost of a mistake on this. Um, it will, the better the data, the better the guesses we'll make. So, and the cleaner it is for the machine learning uh, to draw the patterns, the better it will be. It's because you can throw a lot of stuff uh, which will just be noise to the to the machine learning uh, algorithm. So cleaning the data beforehand so that it makes easier for them to for the machine learning model to to find the the the, the patterns is very useful as well. The second one that we spoke about was the minimum viable model, which is about setting the expectations on a realistic way. So an exercise to be done between the technical and the business team, uh, looking at what is the vision and bringing the vision down into technical requirements for the machine learning model uh, and a way to also to uh, make sure that we are not starting work on something that is really impossible to achieve and the third aspect that we talked about uh, was starting without machine learning always if possible start without machine learning and then move to a to automate that process later on. Machine learning is about optimizing, about automating stuff. Uh, it's best if you don't automate, if you don't optimize early on, right? Uh, begin without it and then move later to machine learning. Um, some final notes is, is that the risking doesn't mean avoid risking all, at all costs. So I shared some techniques, but of course, sometimes you have to start with machine learning. Sometimes it's the only choice you have. It's too hard. It's too much data. It's too hard to draw uh, heuristics. It's too, I don't know, complicated. Or you already have a lot of people that have that uh, expertise. Then, sure, it's worth it. Uh, but whenever possible, diminishing risks is uh, desirable, I would believe. I also didn't spoke about other techniques to... Uh, to, to the risk machine learning. For example, use transfer learning from models you already have or models that are available online uh, for your specific use case. Right? That's one way uh, to, to the risk as well. Or create a model that has multiple use cases. That's another way to the risk. Um, but that becomes conversation for a different uh, time. So thanks everyone for joining uh, this. Um, you can follow, these are my uh, general uh, social links. Uh, if you follow me on GitLab, I post updates of what I do every weekly, bi-weekly. Uh, I'm also very open to feedback over there. Uh, my Twitter, my LinkedIn, and well, hope you enjoyed.